Good afternoon. Welcome to this live talk show. Now, over 70% of Uganda's population are the youth, but this 70% is in lack of sexual reproductive health and rights. Now, what do these rights include? It's information, safe family planning with options and choices, safe conception, maternal health care, and safe motherhood. Now, there's also cervical and breast cancer screening and the treatment, as well as diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of sexually transmitted infections, HIV prevention, and treatment, post-abortion care, prevention, and the management of sexual violence against men and boys, as well as women and girls, including harmful cultural practices, such as female, gen female genital mutilation and post rape care. Now this afternoon for an hour we will identify and address the key challenges and obstacles along the investment chain for mobilizing funds for young people's SRHR budget priorities and the needs. The hashtag is right there on your screen. You can be a part of the conversation. I am Rita Kanye and I'll be your moderator. Now, taking a look at who is joining us on this conversation this afternoon, our panelists include Mr. Jeff Wadilo, who is Executive Director at Jenga Africa. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Right next to him is also Mr. Frederick Okui, who is the Program Officer at Action Group of Health, Human Rights and, H and HIV and AIDS, AGA. That is Frederick. Welcome. Thank you. Now, we also have one lady who's here with us, Dr. Dina Nachiganda, who is the Assistant Commissioner Adolescent and School Health from the, and School from the Ministry of Health. Welcome, Dr. Dr. Lina, our viewers. Now, right into the conversation, we have had two talk shows about uh, this particular issue. That is the access to as sexual and reproductive health and rights here in the country. I mentioned earlier there is a lack. That lack trickles from how much is being provided by the government to the Ministry of Health in terms of what services they can actually give. We have taken a look at the budget, the figures. We have also taken a look at policy on uh, last week on Friday. But now bringing these two together, how does the policy and the budget in terms of what is given, how is it affecting it? We'll start from there and we'll have Jeff just help us explain to us when we take a look at the budget, how much is given, and what actually eventually trickles down to any Ugandan within the country, but in particular the youth when it comes to SRHR services. Yeah, thank you so much and uh, once again, uh, good evening viewers. Uh, when you look at the, the health budget, for the last four or five years, you could see that the budget has been growing in nominal terms. That is the actual figures. Uh, and uh, you could see that the latest figure is around about 1.5 trillion. But that came down from uh, the last financial year of 2019-20 uh, of about 2.5 trillion. Now, if you look at it, you could be happy and say for the last uh, 10 years, the health budget has been growing. But in uh, real terms, in terms of what actually goes down to the person, if you look at the per capita spending on health, we are far below the, the, the World Health Organization's estimates, which should be around about $80 per person per year. I think we are around down about 40 but. Most of that actually comes from our own pockets. Money in health is uh, money majorly from our pockets and external financing. So you want to ask yourself, uh, what is the role of the government of Uganda in health financing? And then when you look at the component uh, on reproductive health uh, financing, which majorly is uh, within uh, the, the budget line on national medical stores, which has all the reproductive health uh, products and commodities. You find that you'd see it growing, but in comparison to the entire health budget, you still see that as a very uh, small contribution to the entire effort, especially to provide, you just say that right uh, in the beginning that uh, over 70% of uh, <laughs> our population of 40 plus million are young people. So how much of that per capita goes to young people. You would also want to see uh, if you break down our, our health budget in terms of what the central government retains and what goes down to the local governments where most of the health delivery uh, service points are, the health center threes. You only find a health center three has about uh, 15 million shillings per year 
which is about 3.5 per quarter. Now, try to break that down in terms of access to reproductive health services. Break that down in terms of uh, the actual commodities that you will find, uh, because also we have drug stockouts of different commodities. Look at that in terms also of uh, the structural and infrastructural realities at the, uh, at the grassroots, where you will find a number of health uh, facilities not having functional governance structures. And that means that uh, as a young person, if they want to access reproductive health services and commodities, there's one huge gap in terms of uh, availability, but also in terms of the governance structures, you would find that there are not so many uh, young people who are even on those uh, health management committees. Most of them are for people who are much older, and they are less likely to understand the needs of a young person. Of course, you combine it with the, of course, the current challenges of COVID-19. That tells you that more resources would be put aside for the emergency uh, quote-unquote kind of services, mm. but RH remains an excluded and alienated uh, service for young people. So in terms of big uh, budget spending, most money remains at the center. When you break it down, uh, again, actually, a number, an, an, a number of resources also remain around the district. But when it comes to the health service delivery point, there's a lot of lack in terms of structure, in terms of financing, and we need to do much more about it. Well, bringing in the Ministry of Health, Dr. Dina, he mentions the fact that there's a lot of money that actually never gets to this particular area. But that money that does get into SRHR service provision, where exactly are the priorities? Okay, thank you very much. And once again, good evening, our viewers. And just to mention a bit of priorities for SRHR, I will speak mainly for the adolescents and young people, but you know it's cross-cutting because we know that is the biggest population anyway. So uh, for adolescents and young people, we really focus on appropriate, age-appropriate messaging for them and also services for them. And more to that, we are also looking at ensuring that we look at the special groups because we know we have young people with disabilities that we really don't look at many times. We know most of them could be lame or disabled in any way. And if they get into any kind of trouble, then they are double as affected as a normal young person. But then we also look at the bigger perspective of the young person. Outside their SRHR needs, what else is there? We know that they have mental and psychological needs. We also know that they have physical and emotional needs that we also need to deal with. So in regard to priorities, we know that information f is key in programming for these people. And we know that the programming is different for the different ages, but most importantly, even for the different geographical re um, regions that we have. When you talk about messaging, people here in Kampala will think we are going to have standardized messages, for example, for every young person, but that is not the case. We know that a young person who is 10 to 15 really needs different packages of messages, and onwards 15 to 24, they would also have different ones because of their needs, okay? But then at the regional levels, a young person in Bududa, for example, will need um, information around what happens in their village and around their district. Uh, that speaks to the kind of language in which the messaging should be and the kind of posters and brochures. We know that as we give this information, it should be culturally sensitive. And that means that someone in Karamoja <laughs> wouldn't understand the same poster, for example, that someone in Wakiso would understand. But again, towards messaging, we look at the access to this kind of messages. When children are in school, it's easier because there is a, a formalized structure in which they, are, um, they kind of get these messages in class and the teachers are there to give the messages quite easily. But now that they're out of school, it's a different story. We know that so many children don't access IEC materials, for example. We know that so many children don't access newspapers and so many children especially in the rural areas, don't access TV or even radio. I was giving a quick example, and I'll still give it to, my, to the TV listeners. I know of a school where the class has 80 children, 8-0, and of these online classes, only 20 children are accessing the class every day. And this is a school, an affluent school in Kampala. 
So if we go down to what he's saying, at the very basic levels in maybe some rural village, in, I don't Bulambuli, know, my in Bulambuli, my, my district, <laughs> you'd find, and yes, and he was saying that in his whole sub-county, only two young persons have uh, a smartphone, for example. So in regard to messaging, we, we are now prioritizing to see that for every young person, we kind of get to their reality of the need of the information and how to get it to them. Knowing that some people will never have a smartphone, mm. some people will never access TV, and some people will never access radio. But also get into the detail of, do you understand if I give this message in English, mm. or do I have to give this message in your local language like Luganda for you to understand? But also, most still, is it appropriate if your mother, for example, listens to this kind of message, would she be shocked, or would she be able to also understand and explain this kind of message for you? So that's around the information. When and then around services. Before we get into the services, as we stay with the information, yes. you mentioned messages, one that are age-appropriate, mm. messages that should fit within the cultural constructs of a particular, say, district or region within the country. Mm. But bring you in, Frederick, as Aga, mm. those messages, mm. how are they received? Are they there? Are they being heard? What is on the ground? Basically, on the ground, you realize that as she said, the messages need to be age appropriate, culturally, and also religiously ap appropriate to the different areas where the messages are going. We have realized that as w when we put more messages on radio, they receive them more because most of these young people be listening to radios, also the community members be listening to radios. They are more receptive because when these messages are put like, we do spot messages, especially encouraging them to utilize these SRH services. Because in some cases, we realize that these services are there in the facilities, but they are not being utilized. So we realize that when we do a lot of mass mobilization for them to utilize these services, they utilize, and in one of our projects in Kamuli, there's a time the facilities were overwhelmed. So we had to also do some system strengthening to ensure that the facilities are strengthened to match the overwhelming demand of young people. Okay. Well, now, Dina, as we get into the services, Dr. Dina, mm -hmm. if the message is clear, mm -hmm. as he has mentioned, then you'll have numbers. What mm -hmm. is the service like? Okay. Thank you. And services, we really speak about commodities. Commonly, that's what, when people hear services, they would run to commodities. But the service is just more than the commodity that you receive at the health facility. The service also speaks to the quality of care that you receive when you go to the health facility and the kind of um, reception that you get at the health facility. We, ha we and still speak about friendly services for adolescent young people, but I'll speak about even the elderly because the scope is you know, up to the elderly. So, in regards to services, this service has to be friendly. If you come to my health facility, Rita, I should say I am happy that I came. Mm. And for young people, this gets even more serious because you know their needs are changing. As they come from childhood to adolescence, they are experiencing new changes in their bodies, some of which they understand probably the teacher or the mother has said to them about this, but some of them are confused about what's happening. So the kind of reception, the confidentiality, the trust that you built with this young person really matters and really has an impact on if they will come back to this facility or they will not. Or if they would listen to the kind of messaging that you're giving them to or they will not. So we really speak to having a friendly environment for the young people that is a bit private and ensures confidentiality for these young people and also accessible. Again, I'll speak to a very rural young person in that village who may not who probably lives more than five kilometers away from a health facility, a public health facility. You see that this is already a decrement to them accessing care. So access to the health facility also sh should be considered. And if they got their other products available, if I go to a health facility and probably I want to test for HIV, will the health worker tell me that come back tomorrow because there is no testing kit. Or if I'm a young person that is sexually active and I need to get onto a method for contraception, and this particular method that have been cancelled for is not available this day, 
and then I have to walk another 10 or more kilometers to the facility. Will I probably come back? So the service delivery means that all the time we should have the mixed products at the facility such that we don't miss anyone who comes to get a facility at the, um, a service at the facility. And then also we should have feedback mechanisms at the health facilities whereby, and these are there by the way, we've seen so many suggestion boxes in our facilities. I think Frederick, you've seen all these. Mm. But are we also responding to what the people are telling us in these suggestion boxes? Because many times people will write and say, Dr. Dina was rude. And then we don't have um, Panado for this time. But no one responds to these messages. So it's just as though we are writing, people are writing, but then we are not giving them response or we are not changing whatever we are doing. So service delivery means a whole package of things that ensures that there is good administration, the health workers are able to respond to the needs of the community, that the commodities are available, and that you know there is actually technology to report to the center of, for example, emerging diseases and epidemics, that there is quick response to and fro from the facility but also to the higher levels. Okay. Could I throw in something yes, on messaging? Yeah. About two years ago, uh, the minister, Nachiwala, threw out a, a threatening message mm. to young people, saying that if they went to a health facility and they were perhaps pregnant and so on, she would uh, task the, the, uh, the, 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 the birth attendants or those who would uh, take care of their attendant services. Mm -hmm to report them to police. But later on, I also heard Minister Ruth Cheng saying, you know what, that would be the wrong way to do things. Mm -hmm. So then I was asking myself what, uh, what kind of synergy we have between ministries in terms of messaging for young people. Mm -hmm. Because definitely many young people who would get pregnant out there would fear to come out, but doesn't mean that the problem will have ended. So I think that we also need to harmonize mm -hmm. our messaging right from the top mm -hmm. so that it is a common, um, clear message about how we want to work with young people and uh, issues of reproductive health. Well, when you mention right from the top, Jeff, if mm -hmm. we, see, we see that there was a reduction in, you know, in the financial year mm -hmm. where it dropped from about 6.4% mm -hmm. to 6.2% in terms of the budget yes. allocated to just SRHR within the Ministry of Health. Right. Now, what does that show? Because if what we're seeing at the top and what is trickling down, in mm -hmm. one way or another, the relationship, yes. what kind of relationship are we seeing? Is there a disconnect? Yes, I think the people who are in charge of our planning uh, function need uh, to be informed by the demands that are coming from um, the, the, the service delivery points. But I also know that, of course, because of the different uh, financing challenges, you also know that a very huge component of our budget is externally financed. So when it comes to domestic financing, you find that uh, the indicative planning figures are influenced more by uh, the most pressing needs. So you find that what would have been real demand-driven financing uh, is, is skipped because then uh, perhaps that is not as pressing as it should. But I'm just thinking if um, we... If, if we skewed our financing from the demand perspective, also from in terms of the numbers and statistics and the reality on the ground, I think our financing would have been more responsive. Even when we consider things like uh, uh, RBF, uh, results-based financing, looking at what outcomes uh, are out there and try to try and, uh, and motivate the actors Perhaps that can give you a little more uh, results. But uh, it looks like our financing architecture needs to be uh, revamped so that it responds to those very real needs of our people and the population at large. Okay. Now, yeah. bringing the population, service delivery, and yes. Dr. Dina mentioned it, the societal perspective right. when it comes to SRHR, what should be said, what can't be said, or what can be said. Frederick, you have gone across the country, you mm. have been able to interact, you mentioned that you had been in Kamuli. Mm. What, what, what conversations go around within the community, minus what is said on radio, about SRHR? Mm -hmm. Basically, within the communities, the subject of SRH has majorly been a, a taboo in some communities. But with the way we are approaching the, the issue, we are trying to use the peer-to-peer -peer approach. 
because we know these young people. They are, they are growing. As they are growing, they are getting body changes. And as they are getting these body changes, they need somebody to talk to. And now with the closure of schools, schools used to plug that gap, whereby we used to have the senior woman teacher, the senior male teacher who used to plug this gap. But now we realize that these children need somebody to talk to. So that's why we have built on our model of the peer-to-peer -peer approach, where these peer leaders in their different communities go and talk to these young people. They share with them the issues affecting them. They identify their issues and refer them to the facilities. And then at the facilities, we have also done this model of strengthening youth corners. So that when these young people reach at the facilities, we realize that most of our health centers, according to the latest studies which we have done, it shows that about 40% of the health facilities have the youth corners only. The, the rest don't have the youth corners. So as we go on the progressive strengthening and establishment of youth corners, it's important that when these young people reach the youth corners, as they spend their time playing these games, the Ludo, the cards, and other games, football, which they play at the youth corners for both girls and boys, they are trained peer counselors and these peer educators who come. They, they, they approach issues in a playful way. Like, they may not come out openly, but as you talk to them, as they play the games, the issues start coming out. So that's the, the approach, but in the communities, SRH issues are taboos. In the traditional society, it was the Sengas and the uncles who were supporting. But now, with the closure of schools, it has also been a challenge. That's why, by the end of this year, we are going to have some terrible statistics of increased uh, unwanted pregnancies and dropouts of school mm. because of this challenge we are having. Well, we already see in the news with a number of particular mm. reports coming in, in particular areas that numbers are increasing over early teenage pregnancies, actually. Mm. But still, bring Dr. Dina when he mentions the fact that it's a taboo to talk about SRHR in some societies. That's a challenge in itself. If you have a service delivered, it is right there but it's not something people can access because of the society. So how, as a Ministry of Health, how do you put that into consideration? Okay, thank you. Um, Ministry of Health is working closely with partners and uh, we are working to see that we demystify uh, such myths and the taboos that he's spoken about. But also we are working with partners like Ed Ministry of Education and Ministry of Gender. How? We are working with Ministry of Education. I think all of us have heard about the popular sexuality education framework. And this is a framework. I know here we know about it. But it's a framework that brings together uh, information packs, age-appropriate information packs for the various ages. And this is for the children in school. And this starts right from three years. There's appropriate information for three years up to maybe five years. Basically, the information is packaged according to ages. So when children are in school, this is a quick way to have the teachers teach the children this. And there are also programs like the PSA that um, looks to prevent HIV spread within schools. And you know that when a child learns a few things at school, you know when they get back home and they would engage and say, oh, mommy, so the teacher said this. So already they are breaking the ice between what you felt that was very difficult for you to get across for them. So that is working with the Ministry of Education to ensure that children really have that kind of knowledge. But then outside school, we know that also so many children, even if they are those that are in school, because of the universal primary and universal secondary education, we know that many are in school every day. But also there are those that are out of school. Ministry of Gender has developed uh, a version of the sexuality education framework for those out of school. So this also targets the young people out of school. But that said that the Ministry of Education, uh, sorry, at the Ministry of Health, we also have messagings and packs for parents. And this really targets the, we call them gatekeepers. The people like parents, people like politicians, the religious leaders, and everyone who in a way engages with young children to teach them about parenting and how to talk to young people. But also very key little pocket books 
for young boy and young girls. So these ones, if someone is in school with a very good font, they can quickly read and kind of get quick information is uh, quick information about changes in the body, what is expected. Yes, yeah, so that in a way demystifies some of these things. But important to it is we are engaging with cultural leaders. The Uganda government, I know that we've engaged with them on sexual reproductive health. The Busoga government, the Chabazinga, and I know and the Toro, or your uh, king, or your. But also, we are looking to see that we engage with many more cultural leaders because we know there are still avenues for engaging young people in, in regards to their cultures. That Sakata is a very good example. And in Busoga, there is what they call, oh, I've forgotten the Busoga one, but yes, we are engaging. It's really about uh, the mouth sexual approach to having the young children living safely and also getting esteem as young people. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to be taking a short break, but when we return, we're going to be continuing the conversation and we're taking a look at the stakeholders' perspective when it comes to service delivery of SRHR within the country. And we'll be starting off with one, the feedback of engaging the stakeholders, how it has been, but also taking a look at a collective effort as a country, all of us coming on board and going forward, what can we do? Keep it NTV. <laughs> Well, we're still watching NTV and we're having a stakeholder's perspective on the trends in SRHR and health financing from the financial year 2018, 2019, 2019, 2020 and 2020, 2021. You can be a part of the conversation. The hashtag is right below there on the screen, SRHR. The hashtag, I'll read it again for you, SRHR in financing trends tr in Uganda, UG. So be a part of the conversation. But here within studio, I am joined by Ms. Flavia Chomukama, Executive Director, Action Group for Health, Human Rights and HIV and AIDS. Aga, welcome. Thank you. And we're still with Jeff Wadulo, who is the Executive Director, Jenga Africa, and Dr. Dina Nachiganda, who is Assistant Commissioner, Adolescent and School Health, Ministry of Health. Now, still going back into the conversation where we left off, Dr. Dina, you were telling us how you were engaging as a ministry every stakeholder the multi-sectoral approach to the delivery of SRHR services within the country. How is that going? What is the perception there from the stakeholders that you engage? Okay, thank you. And somehow I tend to engage with stakeholders also. So, and I'm a stakeholder anyway. Yes, you are. <laughs> but I think speaking to other stakeholders out of myself, I think we are also engaging very often with the media now because of the lockdown and I think many of us have been on TVs and radios to ensure that the message goes down. But the key stakeholder that we always look at is the actual young person and the person who is really getting the services. And I know for sure that if I was that young person, what I would want is, I would want to see um, commodities in my facility. I would want to see a well-motivated health worker and I would want to see things around my health facility really working well. So that is my expectation as a client. And I think, yes, for some facility this really happens, but may it not be the picture all around the country because of um, issues I've already alluded to earlier in the discussion. Uh, yeah, so I think it would be good to increasingly have a few things sorted, like the budgets running down in tandem with the populations that we are serving, and then to have... Um, more products and me method mixes so that we don't go to the facility and there isn't something that we expect to receive at the facility. Okay. Well, uh, one of the things in the statistics that were highlighted is that the youthful friendliness when it comes to service delivery. And Flavia, when uh, Dr. Dino was mentioning what the young person wants and also how the health worker that they meet or engage with, is some they need to be friendly, but what is it like? Do these two, are they at par with your engagements as AGA? Uh, thank you very much, Rita, and um, well, good afternoon, viewers. Um, the, the mix still has a lot to be desired. We do go to communities, and um, you, you find that most of the health centers we have, the services are being provided by adults, and so many times they don't feel the needs 
of the youth at that time. I think what we are doing is planning for them with limited engagement. Because when you go to health centers, apart from the peer educators probably who are linking the, 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 the young people to the health center, you realize that health management committees, a number of them do not have representation of young people to raise the issues of concern. And of course, youth shouldn't be looked at as mere beneficiaries but they should be looked at as partners and decision makers in things that concern them. So if there is a health management committee that does not address the issues of youth who compose 70% of this population, so whose ideas, whose issues are going to be raised? People will think for them they need medicine, they need what, but there are many issues at stake. So you also look at, um, when you relate to, to, to the mismatch, we, the research, the analysis was saying that we are having more centers being opened at community level, from health center two to three. But there is no equivalent match of payment for health, for health providers to provide the services. It means that even those few who are there, who are ill distributed, are going to again be distributed. And it means that we shall have less people offering the services. Because where there were three, they are going to be divided among the more uh, health centers. So for one person to be the focal pa person for youth, to be the one providing ARVs, to be the one who is giving contraceptives, to be the one attending to ma maternal uh, cases, it won't bring out the issues of the young people. So we need to find um, means and ways of ensuring that as we increase the health centers, you also increase the recruitment of health workers to feed into these health centers so that the young people can come and find ready people available, but also sensitized about the needs of the young people. We also implore the health centers to include um, young people on the management committees, to have young people advisory boards that can bring the issues to on table, and um, us as AGA, we've been supporting young people with skills uh, to advocate and lobby the health center, the health center workers, the local government um, district health teams to ensure that our issues are actually on the table. But as I, as, as, as I say this, I also want to look at our thinking as families. We are looking at the young person, we are looking at the health worker, we are looking at everyone else. But it also stems from the homes we are in. I think we are no longer talking about the needs of young people, the sexual productive health needs of young people. Uh, age, age long, we, we had our parents, our aunties, our uncles talking to us about sex and sexuality. And as we speak now, it is the world that is teaching our children what it is that is required. And when you look at the investments that we do at home, the out of pocket we do is just to take the, the people to hospital when they are sick. We are no longer investing in sensitizing our young people, our children, our nieces, our nephews. And when we do, we talk to the girls and we forget that the boys are actually equally at risk. And when we, you know, when we don't talk to them and we only talk to the girls, it means that we are losing a critical fabric because there won't be equal you know, discussion or debate. And so we'll continue to see, for instance, during COVID, we realized that a number of young girls are impregnated by fellow young boys and young men who have been told to have many girls is to be, uh, you are a star. Macho. Yeah, you are macho, you, 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 you are, you know, you sajarata if I talk Luganda. So we need to get to our, back to our roots, start with our families, Look for means and ways of sensitizing our, our children, but also ensure that our children learn how to respect each other, to respect the other gender, and ensure that we are a cohesive society. I think the fabric has gone wrong. Mm. We have a lot of media. We, we love N NTV because they, they share good things, but there are other TV stations and radios that you see that are sharing, even the online. The children are just taking themselves to sites that really uh, create a mismatch between what is expected of them and what is, is right uh, or good for the society that we live in. Okay, well, I'll just bring you into the conversation, Jeff. The times are changing, mm -hmm. um, but is the policy moving ahead with the times in terms within the government? Because the, there's another mismatch, mm -hmm. what we see, but also what's happening and how can we change it in policy? 
Yeah, I think you could say that in terms of policy, I think Uganda has, does not lack policy. <laughs> I think we are over, overserved, if you like. But how do you translate policy to practice is very important. As I said, one of the ways in which you can see policy translating into practice is financing the policies, is financing the priorities of citizens to match their needs. Uh, from a rights perspective, the right to health, rather than actually that we need to be healthy, even when our constitution, Article 39, says uh, we have the right to a clean and healthy environment. Mm -hmm. But to what extent does that policy and constitutional mandate actually translate in uh, actual access to services? There are actually about three A's in terms of what can define our services. There is accessibility. Do our young people have access to the right services? There is affordability. Can they afford them? Um, remember in the beginning I talked about over 40% of health financing in Uganda is from our own pockets. And then we are also helped by our external financiers. What is the role of government of Uganda in health in making it affordable? And then there's the other bit, acceptability. I think that's what ties in with uh, issues of culture, issues of uh, the social norms, but also what do our young people find when they go to a health facility? We used to call them youth-friendly corners, and that actually was taken literally. And you'd find what is termed as a youth-friendly corner somewhere far away from the normal uh, health services that are supposed to help young people. And, and that, that alone actually would alienate, uh, would alienate um, our young people. So from your perspective, policy into practice. But this practice must be financed. And how, how is it financed? By looking at how much does the government of Uganda commit to health? To what extent has it compared uh, its financing to the Abuja uh, declaration of 15%? I think we've never gone beyond 11% when the budget was much smaller. But now it's getting smaller every time. The budget is growing bigger, but the percentage is becoming smaller. So what does that mean? We're not matching uh, our policy commitments uh, by the financing. They, they normally say we put our, our money where our mouths are. Mm. So where are our mouths in health is a very important question in our policy. Mm. Well, when you mentioned the commitment bit of it, as Uganda we have made so many, we have committed to a number of international treaties, different things in terms of SRHR. Right. The commitment seems to be there. The political but will the seems to be there, but it is it translating? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't translate, then what kind of quality of a population are we seeing? Yeah, uh, you, uh, you had Flavia say most of our young people are being raised by themselves. If it's not the TV, it is the housemaid. Mm. Uh, of course, our, our, our parental system has to work because we have to work in order to make our lives move. But that has put our young people to a very big disadvantage and uh, they, they are being raised by themselves and that's how you see those interactions that end up uh, with a lot of uh, teenage pregnancies and then they are also tied up between whether uh, they can move to go and seek help from mm -hmm. somebody who is a little older or they can seek help from a fellow young person and you know what kind of information they get. Very dangerous but also which uh, are you surprised, for example, that Uganda is one of the fastest growing and young populations in the entire world? We, work, we, we seem to work so hard at growing our population. <laughs> How about working so hard to look after this very uh, young population? Which should, uh, as they say, should be an advantage in terms of what they call the demographic dividend. That means the benefit you get out of a, a young and big population. But actually, it is becoming a burden, the kind of poverty. Uh, for your information, I'm running for a member of parliament for my home constituency in Bulambuli, Elgon County. The kind of poverty you find in the villages, you wonder whether the money that government sends from the centre actually reaches. To, to the extent that a 2,000 shillings becomes a very big, huge budget for a, for, for a rural person, 
Do you know how they break that down? And minus health, by the ah. way. Mm -hmm. uh, for a month, a person will buy a matchstick, or rather, sorry, a matchbox. Mm -hmm. They'll buy uh, some sort of uh, 300 shillings. They'll buy a quarter kilo of sugar. They'll buy some paraffin. And then they'll also buy some tea leaves. And that takes them for a month, 2,000 so. Uganda shillings. So you look at the kind of economy. Now, if, for, I mean, if, if, if uh, the need for health struck, look at a budget like that, mm -hmm. where would it fit in, in a rural community? So I, I think, uh, number one, we, we also need to make sure that the level of financing for other sectors of the economy help to bring out our financing for health. For example, if we have financed adequately other sectors like agriculture, which is the mainstay of our people in the rural communities, if we have got good roads so that this person who has earned their little money uh, is able to take their produce to, to the market on a good road, then they are able to make a saving and be able also to put aside for health because uh, we are the major financiers of our own health. When we have rural economic growth, we see some of those health challenges starting to disappear because the, the community, the, the, the rural person, is able to meet some of those out of their own pocket. So we, I, I think an integrated economic growth trajectory for our country is something that government needs to emphasize rather than focusing more on handouts, you know, trying to make things work, but because of the the other bottlenecks, you find that that pulls us back. I, I think we need to have that kind of integrated approach in our financing. Okay. Well, in one of our earlier discussions a while back, we had a conversation with an official from the Ministry of Health, and he mentioned one thing that I think Flavia might remember is that we actually have um, contraceptives that are expiring. They are there, but they're expiring. So there's the provision that is being given, but people are not really aware of these or are they not interested and perhaps you can have you come in Dr. Dina and tell us where is the issue if the Ministry of Health is providing these contraceptives but they're expiring where could the issue be? Okay um, this could mainly result because of planning the planning how are we planning for the service delivery and for these commodities I know that at the district level there is a, a planning a procurement planning meeting every two months and in this procurement planning meeting the stakeholders come to plan and you know use the previous data from commodities that they've been supplied to and look at this to see that they really plan forth looking at the data. Problem could be that people don't take these meetings seriously. I've worked at the district level before and I'm speaking from a point of knowledge. Uh, sometimes this doesn't happen and Flavia would just come and just give a procurement plan just for the sake of giving the procurement plan. So this eventually results to commodities coming through that are not for the community. But that said, we find that in this planning meeting it's mainly technocrats. And if you don't involve people from the community, the youth, for example, if they don't come in to say that for us instead of this, this is what we want, that could result. And I think that is the biggest challenge that happens. Mm -hmm. But also, this can result because there is a limited um, a limited provision for the commodities. So you end up saying that all the time I will give you what I have because there is what there is a national, you know, there's a credit line for every facility and some drugs could be a little more expensive. So somehow s facilities would really look to see that they get what they can from their credit line. Mm. Yeah, but I think it's mainly a planning thing and what we are doing as Ministry of Health is to advocate that on all these planning committees there is engagement of almost everyone such that the needs of the people are coming out and then their demand, uh, the, the response is de generated by what comes out from the demand. Okay. You mentioned previous data. Some data that we have here is that one in every four girls aged between 15 to 19 is already a mother in Uganda. Mm -hmm. That reveals that we have a very sexually active group of people Yes, but now the planning needs to change because this data, yes, it is worrying, but something needs to change. Where should the change be, Flavia? You have heard what Dina has <coughs> had to say. Where should the change be? I, I think it all comes back to, to, to the allocation of resources. If you have um, an envelope that is saying you have maybe 10 million and you're going to use 10 to buy the commodities, how do you expect them to reach the end user? 
So I think it's all about planning. The budget has some little money, but we need to see how we can, um, when we buy commodities, we have a little money that is going to take it to the end user. But also, it's the, 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 those expiries are not only at national level, even at local level. Because we did talk about the friendliness of the services to the young people who need the services. So if the planning committee at that level does not have a person allocated to a health center where young people can go, even an, another site or location where young people feel comfortable to receive those commodities, then they will continue to expire. So we think that allocating resources shouldn't go alone. It should also engage having effective representation of young people on committees that matter, that discuss their health, that discuss their, the, the, the commodities they require, where they require them, and that they reach in time. So it all comes back to budgeting and planning. How much have you put there for commodities? And for these commodities, what percentage has been set aside to ensure they are delivered to the last person? So it's both up down, people have to uh, order for, for supplies, but also top down as they send funds, uh, they send commodities, please attach a budget line for delivery of these commodities to the end user. Okay, now yes. you mentioned um, engagement of the young people. Unfortunately, we're having the conversation, but we don't have the young people with us. Mm -hmm. But going forward, perhaps is also a place that we need to have the young people. And mm -hmm. from the Ministry of Health perspective, as we take a look at peer-to-peer -peer engagement when it comes to SRHR, how far does it go? Does it exist there? Thank you. The peer-to-peer -peer engagements really exist. And it's mainly been financed by our partners. And the way forward now is we are trying, because the peers are at the level of what we can equip them in the government system is at the level of a village health team, to be precise. So we are really uh, advocating and we are requesting all the village health teams to at least have the young person. We know that the peer-to-peers -peer could be a bigger group of young people somewhere, but for a start, we are saying that for us to institutionalize this kind of mechanism, then we have to have them into the institutional structure, which is the village health team. And of course, we also hope that this engagement there can at least be representative of the young persons and also not really depend on what the, uh, our partners are supporting to ensure that peer-to-peer -peer modalities go on. So that is how the peer-to-peer -peer mechanism is going. But also, Ministry of Health is guiding on how this should work in regards to sustainability because we know that even if the partners have gone, the government should be and we are able to sustain these peer-to-peers and the young people don't lose out on the, uh, on the services that the peer-to-peers -peer have been doing. Mm. But how important, Flavia, mm. and perhaps mm. from the country, bit mm. of the entire country, mm -hmm. how important is it, and what do you find on the ground when it comes to peer-to-peer -to -peer engagement? I think where we need to have an honest and candid discussion with our government and our leaders is around uh, community systems. We do have a lot of community resource persons, including young people who have been uh, trained uh, by projects um, and supported by projects and time and again we have said mm -hmm. that we people can't continue to be volunteers. Mm -hmm. Community work and, uh, and, and the work we do to link, uh, you can spend a whole week following someone who is sick, doing home-based care and when, when, it, when the project ends, it stops there. Mm -hmm. So we have always said we would like to see a position of a counsellor as part of the entire health system who would, if there is a youth counsellor, then they are able to bring on board the young ones. If they are old ones like me, our players bring somebody as such. But now we are talking about the young people. And we expect them to volunteer for maybe 50,000 a month. They, 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 they have needs. And you can't take on their time and give them 50,000 for a month. So it's important that we start to, to, to consider planning for these community resource persons and facilitate them better. I know some organizations or implementing partners have increased the money from 50,000 probably to 180 or 250. But that's also a drop in the ocean. The work the community resource persons, the young people do to, re, to, to, to educate, to mobilize, to link is tremendous and requires a lot of energy, a lot of effort, a lot of commitment. So if we don't invest in these community resource persons, we shall continue to see people coming when they are sick or they have other problems like the pregnancies. But if we invested 
in that kind of primary health care and we do a lot of education, a lot of support at that level, then we would find that we don't have much to spend on in terms of ill health because people will know how to protect themselves, where to get commodities from, because the peers are available to link them to these services. But as long as we don't pay it, we'll continue to be, to, to be used um, poorly and uh, we shall miss the, our population, this, the population we are looking forward to, to leading and, uh, and, 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 and being a better, a better Uganda for us. Yes, well, Dr. Dina, you want to say something and then we'll get to you, Jeff, from yes, what Flavia and just I said. I totally agree with my sister Flavia about the community mechanisms and because, yes, that is the primary prevention mm. strategy that we mm. could run with. And just to say that government had, had the CHILL strategy, I think all of us know about it, the mm. Community Health Extension Workers Strategy. Which was, mm. yeah. Yeah, and this was supposed to be a streamlined kind of um, mechanism where the community health workers were going to be paid and but we also remember it had its kind of shortfalls because the community health worker system to supply like to take care of the whole village mm. with only two of them so government is really working uh, like hand in hand with partners and also consulting to see how this can be done but also to say that it's quite expensive and it's work in progress but government is cognizant of the need for those community health workers so just, just before jeff comes in mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dina, I, ha, did they actually recruit the, those two cues? Because that would be a beginning, and then we assess whether it's, it's working <coughs> or not. Mm -hmm. So if they just halted, it means that really the commitment to do it was not sincerely there. Because they would have started with the two, like we do with the adult, the, the old people giving them 20,000. And then you start with two, see how much they can do, see the gap, and then we see how to mobilize more resources to to finance the others. That, that's, well, that's what I would think. It goes back down to commitment. Commitment, yes. Yeah. Yeah. To you, Jeff? Yes, uh, we, when we looked at the government plan to transition from uh, VHCs mm -hmm. to choose, mm -hmm. uh, we thought that was uh, an ambitious plan. But then we looked at it from the perspective, uh, for, for us in Jeng Africa, what we look at is, is empowering citizens at the grassroots mm -hmm. to be able to take it up on their own. Exactly. And that means uh, organizing them into groups that monitor service delivery. If you do notice, uh, most of these uh, services are just very close to where they live. Their health facility is just where they live. Their school is just near where they live. Their water source and so on. So we've organized groups of about 30 per sub-county. And then that trickles down to, to the parishes and villages. And this group can be supported with some income generating activities that bring them together. They can be in tree planting for, for, for money, beekeeping and so on. Things that bring them together for the youth, uh, if they have a football with them, if the young people have a netball with them, things that bring them together but alongside that you have them monitoring service delivery. They bring back this information to some of the duty bearers and actors like the advocates in the community. And then that minimizes one thing. I'll just give you a small snippet of, for example, a district budget of say 20 billion. Only about 2 billion actually goes for infrastructure development. So what does that mean in terms of participation of the citizens to protect that? To because that's where most of the, that's where most of the pilferage is. Mm. That 2 billion, they eat about 7% or so. So what, 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 what is important is for people to be organized. And I've seen government supporting peop young people groups. So if they have turned themselves into maybe circles or whatever, savings groups, and government supports those groups, alongside that, they can also care for their health. They can care for their sexuality. They can care for a lot of things that would bring them together. But to to sustain a, a system which comes, which depends on the center for its functionality and financing becomes a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. they, they need to start it from the grassroots and then government helps by supporting it. Well, thank you yeah. for that. Now, I know that this afternoon we have some solutions that have been uh, put forward. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, we have Dr. Dina here, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Health, representing the Ministry of Health. And we hope that going forward there might be something. But this afternoon we're taking a look at um, the, the 
trends when it comes to SRHR in the health and financing for the financial year 2018-2019, 2019-2020 and 2020-2021. That's all we had the time for as we tried to identify and address the key challenges and obstacles along the investment chain for mobilizing funds for young people's SRHR budget priorities and needs. The hashtag still at the bottom of the screen is hashtag SRHR finance in Uganda, financing in Uganda and you can continue to be a part of the conversation. But having joined me in studio this afternoon is uh, Mr. Jeff Odulo, who is Executive Director, Jenga Africa. We had Flavia Chomkama, who is Executive Director, Action for Group for Health, Human Rights and HIV and AIDS, AGA, and Dr. Dina, also Dr. Blandina, mm -hmm. Dina you can call her, Nachiganda, the Assistant Commissioner, Adolescent and School from the Ministry of Health. Thank you so much for joining us on NTV. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That Pleasure. does it for this afternoon. Thank you. Pleasure. Have a good evening.